What does it take to get out of your head, to get into your life, and to be consistent in it? Part of what it takes is what we're going to discuss, and that is looking for some sense of excellence that allows you to integrate all the bits and pieces together so that you're not overly focused in one direction. The problem in our life is that we, we generally get so myopic and so one directional, or we're so scattered that everything else in life doesn't come together. We don't connect all the dots. As a result, it, it, nothing fits. I know people who work so hard, and if I ask them, why don't you do some changes, they say, where's there time to change? You know, what can I change? What more can I put into my life? I'm doing so much. And let's face it, there was a generation for the first time in our history, a whole generation from the 1960s through the 80s, had a chance to do it all. And they all wanted to do it all. They wanted all the education. They wanted all the benefits. They wanted all that a career could offer them. They wanted all within relationships with the family. Theoretically, they could have it all. Practically, we end up now with a wasteland where there are millions and millions of burned out people. Burned out, dull, with no resounding energy within them. Their children are frequently uh, angry and uh, resentful. The people have gone far in their career, in their education, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, uh, highly intense activities, and now they're looking to start over. What I suggest is you have to first make up some sacrifices. And one of the most important sacrifices is the sacrifice of knowledge. Knowledge is both the most important quality to gain and the most important quality to surrender. Unlike others, I've taken a different approach. And that is, I don't look for always new knowledge. Rather, I look for new meaning. And that means frequently I have to give up what I have learned and what I believed in. If I don't, then I'm trying to put two things in the same space, my psyche, my being, my feeling. How can I reconcile that as a man we're supposed to be a providers and responsible and seek and develop objects of permanency, family, house, neighborhoods, jobs, friends, in a world that is constantly changing, that every day I wake up, I am different. Every cell changes. My perceptions also have the right to change. My reality changes. But what if I'm fixed on old realities and, and therefore I'm afraid to change anything, that I'm guarding an ever-narrowing spectrum of life? Everything is going by, all going by. And we always wish for some of the good old days. Well, I don't know what's good about most of those old days. You know, when, when people look at some bucolic field, you know, or some beautiful cowboy scene riding off in the desert, you know, and sitting around the campfire. Have you ever sat around the campfire? Yeah. You know? Okay. <clears throat> it isn't comfortable, and there are red ants, and there are scorpions, and there are rattlesnakes, and it's cold, and there are a lot of factors that you don't take into consideration when you are projecting an idealism on a reality that does not exist. And, uh, and once we change places and we're actually in that environment, it's not what we thought it would be. And then we start focusing on what it is, and then it disappoints us. And so what we do is we protect ourselves. We don't have to do anything. We can just project. And we project through fantasy, through film, through literature, through poetry, through song, and through superficial relationships, relationships with our work, our family, our friends, and ourselves, that never require us to commit ourselves to simply being in the moment and accepting for what is and not making judgment on it and learning from that experience. But you see, the clever mind doesn't do any of that. The clever mind stays protected and safe so it can maintain its fantasies, its illusion. So the metaphor of life is where most people live, not in the reality of life. And that's what we're going to try to get you beyond. Now, to do that, you've got to give something up. You can't just keep putting stuff in. You can't just have more and more and more. Well, if I only had another workshop, if I only read another book, if Deepak Chopra could spend an evening counseling me, you know, if I could only get Rolf in the right place. We want all these things as if that's what's going to make a difference. Something out there is going to turn us in here into a different person. 
And the other end of that is we had a whole generation who spent almost 30 years looking inside and didn't see a damn thing. They ended up with mantras and, and channeling experiences and out-of-body out of, out of experiences and meditative experiences, all of which meant nothing because it was all a, a creation of their own mind. They created their own internal reality too. But then trying to make that work in the real world doesn't, doesn't happen. A friend of mine I called this morning, I said, uh, where's Peter? Peter's meditating, fine. Peter meditates every morning for an hour. He goes through his exercises. He's a Buddhist, meditates. At noon when I called, or just before noon, just before my show, I said, where's Peter? Peter's just had some raging argument. Why'd you have this argument, Peter? Well, they asked for my credentials and I just blew it and then I just told him, well, Peter, why? Why'd you engage your ego? I mean, you've been practicing this for 30 years. Aren't you ever gonna get it right? You know? And oh, well, I'm gonna go meditate on it now. Bull nuts, you know, meditate on it. We have all these, we have all these contradictions. We think that all we have to do is find that special moment to escape, to rebalance ourselves then come back in and we can tolerate more of that stress, more of the craziness, more of the contradictions. We just had an election where the Democrats were set aside because the more from the government, big government, big spending, suddenly rang home. Now, why didn't it ring home five years ago, three years ago? We had just as much spending, just as much craziness. Part of the reason is, finally, with all the austerity, with the actual income of the average person declining, with less disposable income, with greater stress to maintain certain lifestyles and standards, the person who actually has to pay for everyone else who's not had had enough. They reached a mass critical point. They looked at this system that doesn't work. They look at our rotten welfare system. They look at all these bums who don't want jobs, don't want lives. They looked at all the apologists and said, hold on a second. And you've tried to make me feel guilty because you don't want to do anything except criticize people like me who make a living for people like you. What's changed? Well, what's changed they're starting to realize is that it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican. They both spend money. It's just where they spend money. One spends it on worthless, apologetic social programs that don't do anything for anyone, never has, and there's no proof ever that it's helped anybody. All right? No crime has been reduced. No people have been fed who are today not fed. We got 30 million people starving in the United States and malnourished. We have over 2 million people who are homeless. Well, then what the hell happened to this trillion upon trillions of dollars we spent at this? Should, shouldn't we gotten something in return? Well, of course, no one's looking at the results. We were looking at the platitudes. So the people just went crazy. They said enough. But why wasn't it enough sooner? Because it didn't affect them personally. And only when it affects people personally will you get them to push a button. Well, suddenly everybody's button got pushed because this year they started seeing this absolute stupidity of trying to make our whole society a socialist state, starting with medicine. And people started to ask, why? Why should I pay for your medicine? Why? What do we have in common? You take drugs, you smoke, you drink, you get sick, now it's $200,000, I take care of my health and I got to pay for you? Why? You hate me. You despise me. You wished I was dead. And I should show charity to you. Screw you. That's what Americans began to say. By the millions. And it was for the first time anyone was ever honest. Because nobody wanted to be the person who says, yeah, I'm kind of sick of the system. I'm sick of politicians. A curse on all of them. Because none of them are worth a damn. None of them. Aren't they? You bet. It's just how they spend your money, Absolutely. right? One will give it all to big business because they're both parties of business, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. So we don't have any party, two-party system. We got one party, business. Now, if you're in business and you're one of them, you benefit. If you're not in business, you don't. Open, any of you own a business in New York City? Do you know what kind of hell it is to own a business in New York City? Do you know how the city beats you to down, exploits what you can? Now, if it wasn't the city, we'd call that, we'd call that strong, ar strong arming, we'd call it a criminal act. But because the city's the one breaking your arm, taking every penny they can out of your pocket, taxing you to death, another 9% for working in New York City, 
okay, what's New York City give you for that 9%? Doesn't give you anything. Gives you hassles, hassles you to death. You go live in the suburbs, you got rules and regulations. Every, there's so many rules and regulations, nobody knows what they're allowed to do anymore. No one knows what they're allowed to say. Everything, and everybody wants to be there to fine you and penalize you if you don't do what they say you need to do. As a result, people finally are just fed up with everything. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should even be worse. I'll tell you why. You see, for these people to make this change at this point is not cool, because one administration is going to come in, deficit's not going to go down. They'll take some tax cuts. They'll give you some um, capital gains will come down. They'll give you some uh, uh, tax deductions for families but they're gonna continue spending it in other ways. And they'll, more on military, more on their special projects. No one asks someone, gee whiz, we spent $365 million in this campaign on television ads alone. Who likes someone so much to spend that much amount of money? What are they getting for the money they're spending? They're getting something. If someone spends $15 million to help you get in the Senate, that's a special interest group that's gonna want it back. So you don't have the Democrat special interest group, now you get the Republican special interest interest groups. It's still a special interest group. The only trouble is you and I are not a special interest group. Our needs are not taken into account. Americans are finally saying enough of the big government, but they still haven't said enough of the special interest groups. They still haven't said the system itself is flawed. They still haven't said my life doesn't work. They've expected someone else to take care of a lot of their needs. Now they're saying the only person who's going to take care of your needs are you. So they gave a message, but it wasn't a complete message. It wasn't a total message. It wasn't the most honest message. Maybe it was the best they could do at this moment with the vehicles they thought that they had available. If it got worse, really worse, the message would be more severe. It would be more radical. See, I don't believe that most people are capable in this current context of living to moderate change. I believe what helps most people is a radical change. I don't believe in itty bitty tiny one step change. I used to when I trusted human nature. What I wasn't aware of when I was at trusting was how human nature doesn't trust itself. And therefore the confidence I had in other people they never had in themselves and all the examples around how people could change in a positive way, they weren't taking the lessons of that. They were taking it in, they weren't actualizing it. What generally happens, the only time people change is when they are in a crisis. When they have nothing else to gain but to change, then they change. When there's no other options, then suddenly they do something. Well, what's that tell you about yourself? When the only time you're gonna do anything the only time you're going to give up meats when they, you know, you've had a heart attack? As I mentioned in our last lecture, I got a friend that I got to go see the next week over in London, and he's, he's done for the next six to nine months. He's going to be on his back because he wouldn't change his diet. He wouldn't change his lifestyle. He couldn't give anything up. He couldn't let go. He couldn't change. If you met him for a week, you could write a story that would be the rest of his life, and he, not a single thing would have to be changed. That's how predictable he was. Then how predictable are we? The more predictable you are, the more of a pattern liver you are. When people know what you're gonna say, how you're gonna respond, what you're gonna wear, how you're gonna act, how you're gonna react, then what are you doing? You're not living. You're just in a repeating cycle like a tape that keeps replaying itself over and over again. That's not life, that's not vital, that's not the positive self. So what I want to get to today is how we can achieve personal excellence. And we begin by asking ourselves some basic questions. What and whom can we rely upon to support our changes? Because a lot of people, the very first thing that happens is, well, okay, I'd make some changes, but, uh, and then they start with all the buts. But I don't have anyone who's going to believe it, but I don't have anyone who's going to trust me. I, I don't know anyone else I can trust with the changes I want to make, I'm going to be criticized. I don't have the resources, financial or intellectual or creative. And they list all the limitations. And generally, that's what weighs on the scale. Goes down, they don't change. 
fair enough. But how often do you look at what you do have that will allow you to make changes and stick with the changes? What are some of the things that we all have that we could use as support in the changes we want to make? Going for excellence. Our family. Some families, some won't. Moral right. support. Huh? Moral support. Moral support from whom? Um, you have to believe in yourself, I think. Well, ultimately, you're the only person that's going to believe in you. Anybody else that believes in you, generally it's a projection. They need you to be a certain way. Now that's good. We like our heroes, we like our heroines, we like people who achieve a certain status in life, providing they don't disappoint us by changing what our, what their vision is of, uh, what our vision of them is. But what if you decide you want to be your own person? Well, that's not going to be good. That's why that's why our heroes generally are very consistent. I mean, so, John so Wayne was the same his whole life. So we have to be strong enough to resist that. We have to be strong enough to resist other people's Im influence in our lives, yes. But where is our other support system? Where's it coming from? Who is most likely to help you get through the humps and over the excuses so you can change your life? Who? Huh? Yourself first and foremost. Who else? People with the same beliefs. People who've done it first and continue to do it. If you want to learn to run a marathon, are you going to talk with someone who's saying you can't do it, or are you going to go out and talk with someone who's done it and is going to encourage and be with you? We have no shortages of people who've made major fundamental changes in their life and are alive and well and happy to, to tell you how it's done. It doesn't mean you have to follow what they've done. It means they're there to support you. So therefore, find yourself a support system. Go out and find them. There are support groups all over this country for every kind of activity and every kind of change. And I'm not just talking about getting through crisis like OA and AA. I'm talking about people who are doing positive things. If I want to be an explorer, there are explorer clubs. You know, there are scouts. You know, there, there are people who are doing things. Those are the people who are going to give you positive reinforcement. So go where people have done it. That's number one. How much of our time, energy, and mind is spent on honoring the real true needs versus artificial needs? Let's give an average month. You got, you got a whole month. What are you doing with that month? What are you doing with the time? Where's your income going? Where's your energy? Where's your mind each day? Is it in breaking three, uh, free to become who you really are, taking off all the masks, gaining the confidence to persevere, or is it continuing to refortify the old image and honoring that? You know, if you have a prison cell that you're in and, and you open the gate and each night you go out and you wander around and you say, my God, I love this freedom. It's so nice out here. But then morning comes, you go, I've got to go back in here. I, I don't know where else to go. And you retreat back in. We keep going back in. Why not just break free completely? What would happen if you broke free completely of everything? What would happen? What would happen? <laughs> scare you to death, wouldn't it? Why? why? What, would, what would be scary about it? Because of the unknown. The unknown. What's the most exciting thing that ever happened in your life? <laughs> it's the unknown that becomes known through doing something. There is no such thing as a known risk. Whatever you do that you hadn't contemplated that scared you to death and you did it, there was an excitement. I mean, like a roller coaster. I went on the America's largest roller coaster, and I wasn't aware how tall that was until I started going up it, and then I started kind of looking out to see what a mountain is as high, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, this is 10 stories tall. Give you a perspective, it is four times as tall as a roller coaster out long, in Coney Island. And it just kept going up and up and up, and I'm right in the front car. And my buddy says, all right, we're gonna hold our hands up. And I go, oh my God, hold my hands up. Hold my hands up, I said, all right, so we get just to the top, and so, you know, your hands are going like, this, you know, it, and, and then you look down, and because it's so high up this way, you don't see the track in front of you. And all you see is open space. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, 
the track is gone. <laughs> I went, whoa. And uh, then it starts to go over, and it's just one of the most ex terrifying and exhilarating things because the ter terrifying and the exhilaration are both within the same process. And then once you scream, you know, yourself almost to death, and, and, and every once that I scream louder than anyone else on the <laughs> roller coaster, and it was a great experience. Immediately we want to do it again, right? But it will never be the same, even doing it again, because I knew something I didn't know before. It, it would have had from 100 on excitement, it would have been 95, and then each time, because you would have gotten used to certain parts of it. All these things, the first time I saw the Grand Canyon, the first time I saw the Rocky Mountains, it was so exhilarating. Now, I still enjoy seeing it because every cloud is different. So therefore, when you're with nature, nature's always changing. Nothing's ever the same. And it depends upon how you look at nature. I had a group of people once to my farm, and, and we were going for a nature's walk. And I said, let's enjoy nature. Let's see what's here. And so a group of 30 people go out, and typical people, they walk right through, and they finish the walk. And I said, what'd you see? You know, they didn't know. <laughs> so I said, now let me show you how to be aware of your environment. Be in the moment. So we went back in, and then I had everyone stop. And I said, now, take your mind off everything and just focus on the sounds. Just let your mind be with the sounds. And they heard 14 different birds. They saw an eagle. I had them take a stick and scratch the, the grass. And suddenly they saw all this life underneath there. You know, all the little worms and bugs and everything else crawling around. And there was a family of deer that were only 15 feet off to the side that they hadn't seen before because they weren't paying attention to it. They weren't in the moment. They were in their conversation. When you're in the moment, that's when you are most able to change. You can't change if you're constantly in your mind because you're repeating the thought processes that try to justify change, rationalize change, understand change, and physically, and then consciously, you hold yourself back more often than not. It's letting that thing happen. It's just letting it happen. And we don't like to let anything happen. We are control freaks. We want to control everything we do, every aspect of what we do. We have to have certainty. Well, what if I do this? But what if I do that? I change everything in my life every three years now. It used to be every five years. I just sold my home, New Jersey, selling my ranch, tomorrow, day after, I think. And people say, why would you sell it? It's so beautiful, it's so wonderful. Well, because it's not the only beautiful, wonderful place there is. I want to recreate my life again and do the creative energies again and re-participate again. I want to see different sunsets. I want to see different ambiance. But isn't that expensive? Isn't it challenging? That's the whole point of life. Life should be constantly challenging, where the challenge allows you to grow. Otherwise, instead of growing through challenge, you become predictable through complacency. You look for security. You look for comfort. And with all that you have in the way of comfort, then you become terrified of anything that creates discomfort. The trouble is, discomfort is constantly reminding us that we should be changing. Your fat body that you look at in the morning, or the untrimmed body, or the unfit body, as if somehow, well, as long as I'm putting my energy into my intellect or my something else, my body isn't important. That's a rationalization. The body is important. Now, when you have a body that you love, then it's important. When you have one you don't, then it's not. When you have a mind that you can appreciate, then it's a mind you like. When it's a mind is dulled by, by fears or limited in some way, then you don't pay attention to it. Then you rely upon someone else. Then we project. But what if we had a body we really liked because we paid attention to it? And then allow, our body could do whatever we wanted to do. If we wanted to enjoy it sexually, it's beautiful to enjoy. If we want to do it physically, we can go out and hike up a mountain, we can run a marathon, we can swim across a lake, we can go kayaking or skiing, we can get on a trampoline, we can do anything because our body is something that is 
constantly adaptable because it is constantly fit. It can join us in the moment. Think of all the things you don't do because your body isn't what you want it to be. Think of that. Right? And that's the excuses we start to play. That's where the mind becomes a game. I know people who keep their body sick so they never have to do anything with the body. Because in our society, as long as you're sick, then less is expected of you. You can use that for an excuse for a lifetime. I had a great aunt, or I had a, not a great aunt, but my aunt, who had a wonderful personality, but she, she had a lot of problems, and she was chronically obese her whole life. And as a result, she never did anything. She watched television, she gossiped, she talked on the phone all day, she never did anything. She could have done something, she didn't. She was likable, but she didn't love herself. Her, she always had high blood pressure, diabetes, always had problems with her feet or her stomach. And as a result, look how limited her options were because she chose them. Now think of the person who Kate took, came in the marathon on Monday morning. Finished the marathon Monday morning with MS. She took what she had and made it work for her. That's courage. That's a warrior. We've always traditionally felt that only men should be warriors. Wrong. That is a misperception. Women also have been and are incapable of being warriors, bringing their body and mind up to its highest capacity and can adapt itself to any environment and feel comfortable and confident without having to be aggressive. And that's what's also nice. The person who's really got their act together doesn't have to be an exhibitionist and doesn't have to prove it. They are not manifesting an immature ego in a mature body. So they have that silent strength, that strength that no matter what you do with them, no matter where you put them, they can survive and thrive because all of their senses are present. All of their energies are balanced. But look at us. How many of our energies are balanced? We may have an intellect, but no emotions. And in our society in particular, we think that as long as we develop one set of virtues, we can withdraw others. So our leaders rarely show vulnerability. Authority figures rarely show vulnerability. It is an exception for someone who's considered an expert or an authority to be vulnerable and open and really emote. Well, that's a lack of balance. When a person can't emote, they frequently can't project or feel compassion for other people. Therefore, what they do, they generally do for themselves. Even our heroes today aren't really heroic because most of their deeds are self-serving, whereas a true hero is selfless. And so we don't even know how to determine a hero today. So these things all are directed towards the time, energy, and mind that we spend on honoring the wrong self. Today, I did a documentary. I shot a documentary in my apartment wrote a documentary on cancer, brought people in, gave them a forum, let them tell their story. And it was interesting how many of the patients came in who were angry. Now, I think anger is a very positive emotion because anger is energy. There is a difference between anger and rage. Rage can hurt. Anger can project itself through and create change. The anger of the voters shifted the political balance, though it will have no major impact in the long-term economic scale because of who ultimately behind the scenes manipulates and controls everything. They don't care who's in as long as they're getting their needs in. But it was anger. Anger at injustice can create balance. In fact, if you don't get angry about things, then you have no passion for life. Think of the things that you can rightly get anger about. Segregation, racism, genocide, injustice, ecological and social abuses. Now think of the people who have been prosecuted and persecuted where people couldn't find the anger to become involved. They were uninterested. I use my anger 
to project into creative and constructive processes. That's why all the documentaries I do on AIDS, cancer, and chronic fatigue, because no one else has chosen to see fit to give honor to people who have achieved success with their conditions using alternative motives. That anger came up with positive projects. Most people get so comfortable and so secure in their insecurity and in the complacency of a predictable life that there's no anger left to project as a positive emotion. Or you got a whole generation who tries to be so hip that it doesn't want to perceive itself as having anger as, quote, oh, we don't want anger. Anger is a destructive emotion. No, anger can be very constructive. It depends upon what you do with it as a motivating force. Well, those people generally don't do a whole lot anyhow. What have we created that identifies who we are? What have you done? Because you can't, you can't achieve personal excellence until you have something that you're showing excellence through. Is it your body? Is it your mind? Is it something out there? What are you, what are you creating with consistency on a day-to-day -day basis? Because you're living day-to-day, -day, so why shouldn't your life be manifest day-to-day? -day? We like to think someone else can do it because we generally think ourselves helpless. We're limited. So then we start to align ourselves with isms and assume the isms, communism, socialism, capitalism, or something else that environmentalism, you know, that, that we place our image. So as long as we're attached to a group that's doing something, we feel we're doing something. I don't find that works at all. I stopped being a part of every ism because everything I saw was contradictory. I would lecture at the, um, uh, I would lecture on Earth Day about the environment, and I would watch people eating hamburgers and drinking Coca-Cola and leaving garbage and smoking, and yet they were there supposedly interested in the environment. Well, how could they be interested in the environment and knowing their hamburger first was a, a sacrifice of a life that didn't have to die, coming generally from a rainforest and tropical area that was deforested to grow the hamburger so they could have it. What was the purpose of them being there? And yet they thought, well, I did my environmental bit. Sure, I'm an environmentalist. We all like to feel that we're a part of something because it projects an image. But what if it's not real? Most people aren't connected with things that are real. They don't live a real life that's based upon excellence. From what do we hide? And who do we seek when we are hiding? What are some of the things we hide from? Truth. truth. Why do we hide from the truth? What makes truth uncomfortable? <coughs> if you confront it honestly, then it's going to show what you're doing is not honest. What else? So if you know what the truth is and you deny it, then you're denying your responsibility to be who you are and to honor the real self. All right, what else? Don't be afraid. Everyone in here has a mind. I'd like to hear it. I'd like to hear your responses. This is not a passive input. I want to hear back. Yes? Uh, we hide from our fears. Of course, why do we have to hide from fears? Because uh, we don't want to change. Why don't we want to change? If we don't want to change, then the fears are forever present. Correct. Only when we confront something does it then dissipate. Nothing ever changes until we confront it. That's what I loved about the pioneer and the pioneer spirit, because the pioneers had no option to, to face the fear head on. Where, what was their option? Huh? You're out there in the Great Plains, and there's no one but you. You don't know where there's going to be water or food. You don't know the hostile environment. And you know if you don't get through that pass by wintertime, you're not going to get through. And now you're out there with nothing, and it's too far to go back. You better be very resourceful. Well, the fact is that an awful lot of them didn't make it, but those who did showed that it could be done. And once someone shows it can be done, then it gives confidence to others to do it also.
And a lot of people do it simply because it measures them to make sure they're still alive. I know people who do things because it gives them a chance to reaffirm they're alive. I couldn't imagine going to a nine to five job every day that I didn't like. I couldn't imagine being around someone I didn't love. I, it would be abhorrent to me to spend time doing anything that wasn't something that was meaningful. Do I have such, uh, such a negative thought of life that I would give that time away? You can't have it again. This day will never happen again. This moment will never happen again. You will never be as young as you are this moment. So why wouldn't you treasure it? That's why I don't let people waste my time. I don't talk on the phone. I mean, I'm on and off in about a minute. You know, I don't like to waste my time. I can't live it over. But that's why I've gotten everything in I wanted to. Now I look at what I want to do now. And it has nothing to do with what I've done. That's why the idea of recreating yourself. You see, if you don't try to create an image to please other people, then you're able to create a life based upon what you really want to do. Yes? I think um, a lot of us have been brought up in like a kind of a schizophrenic situation where like if you, whether it's with your parents or whatever loved ones, you decide that you're going to tell the truth, you face a very, you, you may face loss of love. I mean, it's, it's the bottom line. Then you never had love to begin with. Exactly. But love cannot be conditional. Then love doesn't exist if it's conditional. But most of us, a lot of us have been raised that way. If, if you're sitting in a household where mother's beating dad, you might make believe you don't see. If, you're, if your spouse is uh, harming you, you make believe you don't see because when you think about being alone, it's so, ter it's so terrifying. At the what point? Of love. Yes. I'm just speaking in a general sense. I understand, but at what point do you suddenly say, I don't need these as excuses to keep from having a life? That requires a lot of courage. No, there's no courage involved. It requires a commitment to yourself. You're giving more power to false images of other people controlling your life than you have for yourself. But this is the family value quotation that we've learned. The family about the family says this, and if you go against the family, uh, the family will pull away. And it's a very terrifying thing, you know, for a lot of people. What you're saying is true, but for most. Do you make your life more important than that of the family response to you? Not. Of course not. People do. They need that response. They need the input, yeah. even when it's negative. Exactly. I'm suggesting that you become almost like a female warrior. That means you have to create aloneness. I, I, I did that. When you asked about what changed this week, I have four grown children, and uh, I didn't want to spend Thanksgiving with them this year. I wanted to go along a few days away. I was just burnt out. I needed to. And I'm so guilty. I never did. I did it, you know? And they still love me. <laughs> you know, nothing terrible happened. But you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to wait till you're burned out to go and spend time with yourself. It's your life. You should have a right to live it. And others who love you are going to love you because of who you are, not because of your obedience to following their dictates and needs. We have such a codependent society, and we have such false and warped values of how to communicate with one another that when a person is truly open and honest, people automatically fear that and reject them. Fine, I say, I would rather be by myself through my whole life than to be surrounded by people who are not going to accept me for who I am. What good am I to myself if I can't be honest about what I feel, what I think, what I do, what I want to do? I don't get permission from anyone to do anything. Never have. Now, some people have rejected because of that. OK, so be it. That's their right. Others have not. Others have probably wanted to say good, but wouldn't because of fear of how they would be criticized for society. But in the end, those people, none of them, not one of them, have ever been happy people. They've never known the moments I've had. Never. So I got to realize it's my joy, my excitement, my growth, and I'm the one who's going to live my life. And therefore, I just make a decision. It's not anyone else's life. And it comes down to that. Now, that's a free choice. You either make the choice or you don't make the choice. 
But if you think you're going to compromise on the choice by giving a little bit, and that's what people do, they adapt to a bad situation. And then somehow they think because they got a little bit of what they needed for themselves in, on a scale of one in a thousand, they got a 20. But they're still allowing everything else to be the way it is. That's a game. You either change completely or don't change at all. This whole idea that, well, let's just take one tiny little step and then another tiny little step and it takes forever to understand things, that's an excuse. That's absolutely an excuse. If you have the courage to do something, then do it. How many of you have ever had blissful experiences where your mind could not rationalize, perceive, or even understand what it was you were experiencing, but your body experienced something? Yeah? That is where you got to trust. A lot of people won't even allow themselves to feel anything. They're afraid of that. They're terrified of it. Not unless they can understand it, control it, analyze it, and, and try to in some way to manipulate it, package it. We're, we're human beings. We, you know, I look at, an, I look at a bird flying, and, and I think, that bird doesn't understand it's going to die. That bird doesn't understand that it could fall out of the sky. That bird doesn't understand it could be a prey. The bird in that moment is simply accepting its union with its environment. It is floating, soaring. And we calculate every moment. We're never free until we disengage our mind. You disengage the conscious mind, you allow the presence of being to exist. In that moment of existence, then we're open to feel what we are, where we're at, the sights, the sounds, everything comes flooding in. That sense of overwhelming euphoria, that bliss, only can occur when the conscious mind has been suspended. And yet here, we try to do everything like spirituality 101 on the weekend. <laughs> Right? And wonder why we didn't get it. Like my friend, the producer, who meditates and goes into rages. He hasn't got it. He doesn't surrender to the moment. And yet, the only time we generally do surrender to the moment is either in something that is completely in nature, <coughs> like watching animals. Do you ever notice how, how you disconnect your mind when you're watching animals? like you're watching deer and you're going down the highway and suddenly they're cows and you just suddenly watch a cow. Your mind's not anywhere. It's just on the cow. Um, or you're watching a sunset and suddenly it's just all the different tones and, and, and colors in the sunset. You're not thinking about anything. You're just accepting the sunset, the beauty of it. Or in the fall, you're walking down a street and, and the leaves are kind of Christmas and it, there's a little waft of air comes and you suddenly, you just feel this wonderful sense of of warmth and, and comfort in, in the knowledge of that season. Or in the spring, suddenly fresh cut green grass and it hits you and you, you, you remember all those moments when you were a kid when fresh cut green grass. It's ironic that most of what we experience as adults that gives us pleasure, this innocent and honest, is a remembrance of what we experienced as a child. And then we start cutting ourselves off from that. We don't allow ourselves to have the same innocence as an adult that we had as a child. And it's only through the innocence of the inner self that we continue to explore bliss. Because you can't explore bliss if your mind is controlled. You've got to get out of your mind to have the moment. The moment cannot exist if you're controlling it. It will not be there for you. You'll go through motions, it won't be there. It's kind of interesting. I take some of my friends to a, a regular dance. And do you ever watch white people or middle class black people dance? They both have something in common, absolutely no rhythm. <laughs> None. They all just kind of do the same thing, you know? Same step 10 million times. Then I go take my friends up to one of the clubs where street people go. And there's every kind of clothes and scent and, and, and sound and movement you've ever seen. You can't imagine how a human being's body could move in so many directions. And you're thinking, now what's going on here? What went on there was socialization. 
that if that person, white or black, started dancing in primitive ways that express their inner being that every human being has, there's no such thing as non-rhythm, that that would be a judgment upon them. Oh, look at Bob, he's a banker, and he is <laughs> dancing with gyrations. <laughs> We've got to bring this up at the next PTA meeting. Look at Elizabeth. Is she, is she rotating her hips in some sexually suggestive way? The rumors must be true or we'll start some. <laughs> you see, and when is the last time you saw someone on Wall Street, a black guy on Wall Street, a Hispanic guy on Wall Street, walking in with a bandana, going, hey, babe, <laughs> let's trade some money. No, no, it's not gonna happen. It's suddenly, hi, I'm, uh, I was once black, I'm now white. And I, I was born in Puerto Rico, but you won't know that. Uh, there'll be no beans and rice in my meal today because I want to be accepted. Suddenly we all become pasteurized. We lose our uniquenesses because there are very strict rules about what you can and cannot do. There are unstated rules and we start to adapt to them. And then we don't want to be around those people anymore, so we move, right? And we start to change the way we dress, and we change our attitude, and we change our hairstyles, and we change our colors. We tone them down. We don't dress as colorful anymore, or any way that would be so different. Well, what do we change is also we start to neuter ourselves. We, we, become, we become like everyone else, just so that we get the reward. Isn't it interesting that middle class, upper middle class people have to go to street fairs or other places to see what it was to be as free as those people are? We have to go to art colonies, we have to go to the village to see what it is to truly express something. Am I the only person that's perceived this? Have you ever, you know what I'm talking about? You know, and, and yet people don't want to be honest, so you know, we try to be politically correct. Well, I see this dishonesty all the time. I mean, look at doctors. When was the last time you saw a doctor come in, you know, dressed really hip? I mean, having fun with the dress. Long hair, fun dress, right? Playing some wild music. It's going to work on you. <laughs> Man, that would scare someone to death. You're my surgeon? No way. Uh-uh. Goodbye. I'm out of here. I want Dr. Shapiro coming in who's very exact and everything looks exactly like every doctor should look. I mean, but we start adhering to these dress. And then what happens is these people go out and get very kinky in their sex, right? Oh, yeah. They start having their own secret little lives where they have all these strange fetishes or different. And then are you programmed? You call up the body, somebody said, uh, who, and who goes into your S&M shop and it was a psychiatrist, a doctor? Yeah, I, I, I went around. I, I, interviewed, I interviewed call girls. I, I um, went to every kind of sex thing there is to go to to see who goes there. I'm curious. I'd love to find out about all this stuff. <laughs> see? I want to know, who goes there? What do they do? <laughs> what do they like? What don't they like? And they tell me. And, uh, and I'm amazed, you know, right? I start finding out about all these ultra-Orthodox Jewish men who aren't supposed to have anything to do with this, who go, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they go. Trust me. I could show you them walking in and out, right? And, and I could take you down to, I could take you down to some of the, the very expensive places where these call girls get enormous amounts of money. And sometimes just to have a man, I had, I talked with one in particular who was very interesting, who said that after the first time it was very nervous sex, and after that the man didn't want to have sex, just wanted to talk. I said, what did the man talk about? The man talked about the things that no one else would listen to him about. He was a very, very powerful CEO with a major U.S. corporation, and uh, no one would ever allow him to be vulnerable, because in the world he's in, if you're vulnerable, you're destroyed. And so the only time he could be vulnerable was, wasn't with his wife, she said, because his wife had certain expectations, too, of him. He had to be this certain image. And so, and his friends, same way. Nobody wants you around if you're vulnerable, if you're in a powerful place. So all these powerful people have a hidden life where they can show who they really are. And it doesn't mean that they're quirky or, or extreme in any way. 
I'm not talking about people who are, are sociopaths. I'm talking about people who simply can't be honest because everybody has an image of them and they can't change the image. And that's unfortunate that you can't be who you are. We couldn't accept someone for who they are. We have to have them a certain way. Well, then who's wrong, the person or the public needing that perception? Or both, one for playing into the hands of the other, that they are something when they're not. I like people who are honest. And I never find those people very often. But when you do, those are the people who are fun. Those are the people who generally, when people are open and expressive in an honest way, not hiding in the closet someplace, those are people who generally will do everything else in their life with openness and honesty. But you can't do it bits and pieces. I have a buddy that I grew up with who was a tough football player. He's all American. And no one ever knew, and I didn't even know, it was his best friend. We grew up from the age of one together. And at age 20, he showed me, when I came back from college and we were back at Thanksgiving, he showed me a box of poetry he had written, years and years of poetry. I said, this is really good poetry. You should publish this in the newspaper. Oh, no, no, no. You know what that do to my image? You know, not in this town. People wouldn't understand. And you know, he was right. They wouldn't have understood. I mean, overnight, he'd have been called every name there is. He wouldn't have been invited to places. His whole reputation for the rest of his life. But in his mind, since once out of college, you no longer have a life where I come from. You just have a routine you go through until you die. And he needed that image of what he was when he was a somebody in high school. And so that's the way he's lived. How people get out of their mind. Right, well, that's what we're getting into now. Are we focused on the physical, spiritual, and mental self? And if so, how? Because again, you cannot develop one, you've got to develop them all if you're going to have balance. I know scholars who can tell you everything about something and have bodies that are old and wrecked. So they enjoy only one little infinitesimal part of life. And even in their scholarship, they have no knowledge of anything else except what they're a scholar in. Well, what kind of life is that? It's one that's given them recognition. And as long as they've been given recognition, then to their mind, that's enough. But what if you didn't need recognition? What if no one had to acknowledge you for anything? What would you do different? You'd lighten up, <laughs> right? You'd free yourself. You'd be more open, more spontaneous. You'd go back and remember what it was to be a kid again. You'd try experiencing things again. You'd try exploring. That's what I loved about the 1960s. You know, we were free to try life. Some did excesses, some did stupid things, but a lot of us didn't do anything harmful and simply used as a time to free our minds and our bodies and our senses and our spirit. So we didn't go into the conforming molds of our parents. We were the first generation in this country's history to do that. And some continued to live by that. Others fell right back into those molds. They said, okay, I had my you know, 15 minutes of freedom, now let me go back to being a cultural prisoner. So the first thing we do is we say, what do I have to do to balance myself on each level? Well, all right, physically we know. We change our diet, we detoxify ourselves, we start eating only the live foods, raw foods, healthy foods, no junk at any time for any reason. No more sublimating because we're lonely. No more eating because we're frustrated. No more pigging out because uh, we're anxious and are not dealing with our problems because our problems we're going to face now. Food is not going to be a substitution for facing a problem. So as long as you're taking only in what your body requires and only the best of what it can have, then over a period of about a year, your body's going to detoxify and you're going to be healthy. You exercise every muscle in that body, so when you look in the mirror, within a year, you're going to see a body that's, you know, that, that is as perfect as it can be for you, and you're going to be happy with it. You're going to like yourself physically. That's going to be a long life and a healthy long life. You're going to look at your spiritual self and say, I am a spiritual being. You see, we have a lot of ways that we trap ourselves. We say we can't be sexual and be spiritual, because we say spiritual denies sexuality. We have to give up sex in order to, we have to, in effect, we have to sublimate the desire of the body in order to enhance the spirit, and that's nonsense. 
That's one very, very uh, limited perspective because you can have very healthy and happy sex, healthy and happy body, dynamic and free mind, and be completely spiritual, as spiritual as the Pope or anybody else. There is no such thing as someone being more spiritual. You know, I don't care how many degrees you have on top of your spirituality. Ultimately, if you're a giving, kind, warm-hearted person who cares about other people, then you are spiritual. Everything else is pretense. Everything is pretense. Everything is ritual. And the ritual is a dogma that is meant to manipulate us into believing that as long as there are interpreters between us and our higher being, then we no longer are capable of making our own determinations of how our spirit self must be manifest. Mm -hmm. We have to have someone else interpret it for us. Nonsense. I don't have to have anyone interpret anything for me. As long as I'm a good-hearted person and I love life and I love nature and I love people, then I am as spiritual as any human being on the face of the earth. It's that simple. Spirituality is in the giving unconditionally of the love that we all possess. Now, enhance that. <laughs> Improve on perfection. The very nature of our being is that we were born perfect and we spend our life denying it. The person who is spiritual accepts their perfection and then manifests it. I don't believe in guilt. I don't believe that we are born flawed and deformed and that we are born with the art of suffering as a justification for our lives. You don't have to, you don't have to suffer in order to grow. Most people think that the only way they can grow is through suffering. Not true. That is a very limited perception. But that comes from a whole dogma in controlling people. If you control a person's sexuality, if you control their appetite, if you control their mind, then you control the person. So very clever people throughout history have saw what it is that your natural impulses, and the first thing they took away is your freedom, because you can't be free and control people. So as long as they told you what you should believe and what you should feel, then anything that you felt or believed that didn't go along with the prevailing view, you were made to feel guilty. If you did anything about it, then you were punished. Well, if there's enough history of punishment for doing something as a natural impulse or something you feel good about or exercising your spontaneity or your unique self, then you're not going to be so quick to do it unless you're a very courageous person. When you have millions upon millions upon millions of martyrs, then you're going to think twice before you become different. Isn't it interesting that the CEO of a corporation we can allow to have any excess they want, but only if they're the CEO? And we can allow the person, the, the, the lowest person on the totem pole to have, to have a life and lifestyle and behavior that's different. It's just everybody else is a functionary in between and they all must conform. And we don't ask about those contradictions. If we did, we'd find that we can be just as free as we want to be and do what we want to do. But you've got to be willing to be responsible for yourself. So we free the mind by examining what the spirit can do. The spirit can give. The spirit can care. The spirit can love unconditionally. You see, when you're a spiritual person, you don't see black, white, red, green. You don't see rich, poor. You don't see educated or not. You just see people. And you see what they are. And you're not threatened by their differences. If you're gay, I'm not. I'm not threatened by your being gay. Why should I? Why? That's your, that's your right. You have a right to that. How can I say that you shouldn't have that right? Because something in my background says that good people don't do that, that you are born of this. Nonsense. Nonsense. That's your right. It's your right to be Jewish, your right to be Catholic, your right, right to be Islamic. That's your right. Now, do I look at you as a Catholic or a person? I'm going to see you as a person. You will have to prove to me that I'm not seeing you as you are. Now, some of you will do exactly that. You'll show me only your images. You won't show me your heart. You won't show me your soul. You won't show me your essence. You won't show me your uniqueness. You won't show me your beauty. You'll show me an image. And then I'll say, I'm looking at an image. Okay, I let it go, and I go on. 
just one more of the billions of images that fill this earth that have conformed and given up their uniqueness. Or you show me your uniqueness, because it's the uniqueness of the open and honest self that is what bonds people. That's what creates the spiritual connection. That's what draws us. I see potential that's not actualized. If you have potential, which we all do, but you're not willing to actualize it, then it's, then it's a meaningless gesture. So the physical, the emotional, the emotional is being able to express what you feel without fear that someone's going to condemn you. The very fact you're going to be open is going to be condemning enough. The moment you're open, people who are not are going to resent you completely. They'll find ways of resenting you. We don't like openness in our society. We say we want it, and then we, we're given to it, we reject it. And the person that brings it, we don't like it. It's like health. <laughs> Do you realize how we've rejected health and its advocates over the years? Because it means that we have to acknowledge that there is another belief that's equal to our own, unhealth. We're not going to accept that. Now, are we heroic? Because it's through the hero image that we frequently learn how to grow. It propels us, it projects us. For instance, the warrior, the healer, the sage, think of the person that's wise, that spends a great deal of their time studying, that learns, and then goes out and shares that knowledge with others in ways that allows others to grow. That's a sage. Think of the people who take the skill of communication and, and compassion and nurturing, and they give that to people. That's the healer. And think of the person that looks at injustice, looks at betrayal, looks at evil, and is willing to take a step forward and say, it stops here. I will not allow it. That's the warrior. All of these people are heroes because they're all defining a responsibility that connects them to all other larger realities. Something beyond themselves. Something that is selfless, not just selfish. They can maintain that as long as they're balanced. The healer can continue to heal as long as they're healthy. A healer that's not healthy cannot heal. The warrior, if the, the warrior is mature, the person that fights like an advocate, a citizen advocate, a public advocate, that person, consumer advocate, that person can continue to go back into battle over and over and over again their whole life because they're fighting for higher ideals. It's a natural part of their energy. They're manifesting the energy every day. So instead of becoming weaker by being in the conflicts, they become stronger. Theirs is not an ego. They don't have to win and dominate. They merely have to correct an injustice. I used to listen to people say, well, you know, uh, violence begets violence. Great little trite cliches we surround ourselves with. I want to tell you something. Any of you in here have children? Do you? What if you came home and someone was stabbing your daughter in the throat with a knife? Would you say, I'm not a violent person. I'm going to go over and meditate on this, and I'll come back tomorrow. You're going to save your daughter. We have every right to manifest a strength that stops the aggressions and transgressions. If we don't, then we lose our responsibilities for other human beings. I know people who would not have fought Hitler, who would not have fought the Jews dying. That is cowardliness. Do not hide behind any pacifism and call it anything else. But the warrior doesn't have to in any way start the conflicts. In studying the martial art, the very first thing you learn is you never learn it so you can beat someone up. You do it as a meditation so you can stop people from being beaten, but not to beat someone. And you only use as much strength as necessary to stop the conflict. In our society, not enough individuals have gained the strength to feel they can stand up and be the warrior. That's why we had yesterday a massive group of people who stood up and said, we don't want you around anymore. We want you out. They were manifesting some of their warrior energy without even being aware of it. They were standing up. 
But think how many injustices you see in the workplace, and, and, and we don't do anything about it. We don't feel that we're the one, right? And we look down, we look away, and we walk away. Huh? It's never difficult to do something about anything. It's just what you're willing to risk to try. It isn't the risk. I've been beat up a lot of times when I was growing up. So? But I was able to know that I would at least address injustice. To my friends, to, uh, two uh, Seventh-day Adventists would never fight. And they were always getting people fighting them. And when I'd see you know, people fighting, I'd just go and jump in and you know, uh, take up for them. It used to make me mad because I'd get my butt beat <laughs> keeping them from getting hurt. Right? Suddenly they were out of it. They were overwatching. Right? <laughs> and and I'd say, why don't you take up for yourself? And they'd say, well, we're taught not to. Well, that's their religious beliefs. But remember, once you take on the religion, you don't become a person. You become an extension of your religion. And think of all the things that are done in the name of religion that are inhumane. That only when you're not in that religion can you see how inhumane they are or how foolish they are. But once you're in it, you've got to accept it all. You know, and that's true of any ism. Once you become a part of the ism, you lose sense of self. And that's the danger of losing self in any of these particular movements. Now. I want to go through in a moment, we're just going to take a five minute break, but I want to go through, I want you to think for a moment, what do you do or what have you done that manifests the warrior, that, that person that stands up for injustice, and, uh, to injustice, the healer, that person that extends compassion, care, help, and the sage, that person that gives, that gives knowledge, that, that helps, that extends. And those are just a few I've used. I could use other archetypes. But I want you to think what you do in your own life, because I'm sure that you have a lot of these qualities you're not even aware of. Some of the ways that you have manifested some of these positive energies. Yes. So you help people with health issues by taking knowledge and sharing it with them to see if they're interested. Right. Okay. Some of the others? Yes. Climbing mountains. We have to stay climb mountains in the in the fall or in the spring. Okay. Some of the others? I'm raising six children. So all three. All right. So you manifest all these in the raising of your children. Okay. Um, confronting my wife. <laughs> confronting her? Why do you have a wife you got to confront? I don't anymore. It's, I mean, I'm going through that now. Oh, so you're out of the marriage? Yes. Good. Not totally, but I'm on my way out. Yet. All right. Are you going to find someone else you have to confront? <laughs> Not, no, I don't think so, no. Okay. Are you going to spend some time by yourself and try to figure out what your own meaning is yes. without having to have someone else to figure it out with? Finding time alone is very important. And I mean quality time. Have you gotten to the point where you can tell people, sorry, my time, period? All right? It's important that you're able to do that. And not just a moment here or there, but real quality time. You deserve it, give it to yourself. Now, how do we face challenge? What are some of the ways we, what are some of the things happen when we have challenge? Challenge. What happens when you face challenge? Also, uh, sometimes when I'm challenged, I have a tendency to resist it. Why do we resist challenge? Uh, well, I was going to um, say I, I fear being challenged at times. <laughs> Based on the situations and the conditions, I'm subject to adapt, but my initial insti uh, instinct is to resist it because I fear. Because we become rigidified. Part of us is defending the merits of our own ego, 
When we're being challenged, there's something that can be taken away. So we're afraid of what's going to be taken away with a challenge. Right? Most challenge is, is, is going to diminish us in some way. Something's not going to be there that was before we were challenged. Yes? Um, I think part of it, too, is the fear of energy loss. I mean, there's this, the, wall, the wall when I'm about to change. I um, think about what I'm going to do. And my whole body is like, I don't know if I want to do this. And it's not even on the, it's the level of thinking about it. There's a great quote from de Kooning who said, whenever I have a good idea for a painting, I have to go lay down. <laughs> and um, I think there is that. There's a very strange resistance. Because something may not be the same again, because if you go to paint a painting and you can't do it, if you block, then you're going to be judged. You're going to judge yourself and others will judge you too. The whole idea that we have to continue to remanifest who we are through what we do by going into challenge means that we can always fail at these challenges. I that would diminish us. I think also just the level of energy that it's going to take to achieve something too is frightening. I think that in itself. That, that, that's a typical uh, thought, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That the, what she said was that the energy that, it takes, that, that is taken away from us with challenge. I would say that I'm energized by challenge. You give me a challenge, and I have more energy than ever. I love the idea of doing something that I've not done before. It totally invigorates, because when we become rigidified by our comforts and standards and our view, we become inflexible. We're a nation of inflexible people. Look, it took 40 some years for us to make enough of a decision to remove even just simply remove people from one political spectrum to choose another. Whether we wanted a large government that took care of everyone's needs or whether we wanted the individual to have more responsibility for themselves, right? Big decision, it took 40 some years. That's a lifetime for some people, an active whole adult lifetime. You can imagine what would happen to most people faced with, all right, today you've got a new challenge. Today, no one's going to make your meal for you. No one's going to cook your food, clean your house, uh, wash your body, groom you. No one's going no to pet your brain. You have to do everything yourself today. You have to create your life fresh today. That's a challenge. You could say, great then I can do anything and be anything I want to be today. I'm going to create a new meaning for my life today. And that means that there's all unknowns. You have to make something happen that otherwise would intrinsically have not been there. When I woke up this morning, there was no documentary on alternative cancer the way I did it. Tonight there is. Something now exists that didn't exist this morning. When de Koning decided to go through that energy, there's a painting now that will forever be there that wouldn't have had he not accepted the challenge. The book, the poem, the song, the act, the gesture that otherwise would not exist, that you created, it wasn't there until you affirmed your power. You couldn't do it without affirming your power. The very creative process itself is energizing. It engages. If you free yourself, you kind of almost have to step out of the old self. And that's part of what reaffirmation is. You reaffirm your right to be who you want to be by reaffirming meaning. Now, the hard part of this issue is deciding what meaning is to you, because that's going to determine everything in your life, everything. Example, how does our background create meaning? We like to think we create meaning. I'm suggesting that's not true. I'm suggesting that your meaning is created for you. Now, let's take a look. Let's say you live in the inner city on a lower economic scale. What will be some of the meanings of your life? What will have meaning to you? I'm going to hear it. Come on. Poverty. Poverty will have meaning. That is the meaning of your life. So therefore, part of your, uh, part of your mindset, part of your reality is how do I get out of the poverty? Or how do I survive and adapt within the poverty? Some people will not accept the poverty as an end. They will see meaning in getting out. Therefore, they'll be more conscientious. They'll study harder. They'll work harder. They'll be more focused. And they'll always be looking beyond the poverty. You must look beyond the limitation in order to achieve a transcendence of that limitation. 
If you look at the disease, the cancer, if you look at the mental illness, the depression, if you look at the candida, if you look at your fear, then that's all you will see. You will continue to see a reflection back of your fear. You've got to look beyond that which you're afraid of. Always look beyond your limitation. That is where the salvation of your gesture is. That becomes the new meaning. You've got to look beyond the problem to have a meaning that transcends the problem. Otherwise, the problem becomes de facto self. So, for the kid that's in the ghetto who, when he wakes up in the morning and he sees hustling, he sees dirt, he sees poverty, he sees neglect, he sees abuse, he sees abandonment by society, he sees subway trains going down, taking people from the white suburbs of Connecticut to the power base of Wall Street and points in between. He does not see himself on that train. He does not see himself where he should be. As a result, he will never get there. You will never get where you do not focus your attention. And you will get what you fear most. That is the irony of this. You will always get what you fear. You fear death, it is always present. It is a constant reminder to our mortality. I take no day for granted because I do not have any guarantee that tomorrow I will not be dead. I've seen many people who one day I was with them and a week later they were dead. What could they have changed if they knew they only had a week to go or a month to go or a year to go? The Zen master lives, the samurai was taught to live as if they were dead. Where death is always present, then you must affirm life. If you do not affirm life, then you don't have it, you have death. You're merely waiting for the body to succumb. So when I look at a problem, I have to see beyond the problem. If I don't look beyond the problem, then my meaning of life is defined by the problem. So therefore, my candida, or my blackness, or my educational limitation, or my wealth or lack of it, or my bad marriage or lack of bad marriage, or lack of relationship, or my need for relationship become the only meaning I have. These are merely things and objects. They are all ultimately inanimate to myself because there's no person that can give me meaning if I don't have it for myself. And yet, people are forever seeking meaning through someone else who has meaning. Why do you think people go to religion? Why do you think people join political campaigns? Why do you think people are entrusted in, in, uh, in uh, the principles of dynamic personalities? Because they see a meaning that is absent in their own life. Because a person who has meaning doesn't have to join others. They first manifest it themselves. The healer must start by healing themselves. The warrior must start by ridding themselves of the fear that would make them disguise their cowardliness until they're faced with conflict and then run or excuse themselves. Do you know how many times in this movement, this environmental movement, I've had people who would come to rallies and something, and then when it really got tough, then suddenly you wouldn't see them again. What I call weekend warriors. People who like to think that they're a warrior, but they don't have the mantle to stand up consistently. So they hide within someone else's meaning. The trouble is no two people can have the same meaning. It's like fingerprints. It's like biochemistries. So the best you can do is try to find compatibility with others who have meaning that at least parallels your own or have their own ideals that allow you the complete freedom to express and explore your own meaning. Otherwise, the relationship becomes the primary meaning of a person. Well, what's your life? Well, my life is my relationship. I think about the relationship. When I'm not with a person, I think about the person. When I'm with a person, I think about the person. And that's my life. That's my meaning. Or my job. I'm always thinking about my job. I have to worry about my job because my job gives me my meaning because it gives me my substance, gives me my, 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 my car, and my house, and my clothes. And without that, then I have no meaning. I'm just a person like everybody else. So then the job becomes the meaning. Think of that. Think how limited that is. Or the cause, you know. 
I just got off the phone this morning talking with someone who, when I was thrown off the uh, uh, Radio Pacifica station in Washington for taking strong stands against the FDA, and they censored my program. And uh, there was a small group that uh, formed that uh, you know wanted to get me back on the air. But I saw my discussions with them. These people were taking their meaning through me. I went down there, and I was happy and having a good time, and I was laughing and joking. They were deadly serious. And then now that they, now I have, now I'm going back on the air, by the way. And uh, there will be some programs that they don't want, and they're going to take all my nutrition programs. But they won't take any on my hidden agendas. Fair enough. I'd rather have people learn how to save themselves from disease using alternative means, even if it means they're not going to be educated directly about the FDA on my program. There are other vehicles. But at least there will be enough given that will make a difference. These people says, no, 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 you can't go back on there. You can't go back on there. We believed in you. I said, oh, you mean you don't believe in me now? <laughs> now I'm not believable? Because I look at issues pragmatically and in a larger context. I said, and, and so now, now, of course, the rage. Now they send a letter of rage at how I abandoned the principles of idealism that they needed. These are people who don't have a life, who don't have any true meaning of substance. So they get into my life. I don't want these people. I try to stay away from these people. That's why I don't have followers and I don't have groups or places where people can get into me, because there's a danger in that. But you see this. You see it all the time. They want to go fall on their own sword, you know, or you to do it for them. But do they have something constructive put in its place, a meaning? The answer is no. We have to look at what is our problem and look beyond the problem. So the kid that looks beyond the problem will get there. The person who looks at finishes the marathon before they've done the marathon will be the person more likely to do the marathon and finish it than the person who sees that every step is a terrible feeling on the body where all they are locked in is their pain the pain in their legs and their arms and their chest. And that's why part of our exercise in doing the marathon is always to see yourself at every stage of the marathon doing it. And then you use that guided visualization. That gives you your power as an inner process. If I see myself being out in New Mexico, then I'll be in New Mexico. If I don't see myself in New Mexico, I won't be in New Mexico. Do you understand what I'm saying? My meaning is taken from my ability to project where I want to be and what I want to do and the process of obtaining that. I am a part of my process. My meaning is a part of my process. So I create meaning that allows process. Therefore, it doesn't have to be goal-oriented alone. It is process-oriented. Along the way, as a part of your process, goals will be achieved. If all you did was look at goals, then when the goal is achieved, you have no more meaning. And you didn't learn anything in the process of getting to the goal. Like someone, I don't have any of the trophies or awards on my walls here in the city. <clears throat> and someone says, why not? And I said, because it's not winning that's important to me. Winning is merely a byproduct of the process of honoring my body and having a meaning of life that defines excellence and the excellence to take my body to its highest level. In taking it to its highest level and all the discipline and focus that it occurs, I have to be able to surrender the limitations of the mind because the mind will control how far the body can go. The mind will control how healthy the body can be. If you don't believe you can help yourself mentally, then your body will not be improved physically. It is crucial. I interviewed someone this morning from Sloan Kettering talking about body-mind relationship and cancer. The person doesn't believe they're going to get well will not get well. So if in the process of attaining excellence, I'm using races and other ways of challenging myself, then those are merely challenges of my meaning. You see, I'm the kind of guy that if I live my life in three-year increments, my, my goals are three years, therefore my meaning is for three years. If it's in environmental issues, if it's in creating, if it's in helping, three years, because that gives me a lot of challenges and room and time to develop attitudes, new attitudes, new skills, new criteria. I can't keep using the old for every new task. And our problem is we don't want to learn new tasks. We, we, we don't want to learn new skills. We want to keep applying the old formula to new challenges, and it doesn't work. 
I have a friend who was a lawyer here in New York and miserable, hated it, didn't like the law profession, didn't like lawyers, and was stressed to the hilt. He was successful, but he was stressed out. Now he's in New Mexico, and he is a landscape architect. He is a gardener. He had to learn architecture. He had to learn landscaping. He had to learn agronomy. But he loves it now. He absolutely loves it. Far more spiritually meaningful to him. He has new meaning. He was a lawyer because of what the meaning was for him was given by his parents and his, his class. Now, let's say you're a rural, you're an inner, you're a city person, but you're a wealthy city person. You're a middle class city person. Your meaning will come from maintaining your stability. Maintaining what you have is what the middle class tries to do. So your whole meaning of life is going to be very narrow. You're not going to take risks. You're not going to take chances. You're not going to exceed any of the boundaries that you've been told you could, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, on any level. You're not going to. You're going to stay within the parameters because anything you do that threatens that stability threatens meaning. So you'll honor the superimposed meaning and all your life is doing and it becomes trivialized. It honors the meaning given to you. And that's why you talk to people who don't have a life and you look and they don't have a life. There's no challenge. But they can't have challenge. A challenge would mean they'd have to have a different meaning. You can't compete with meanings. One's got to give up in order for the other to free you to be. You can't be in two places at the same time, not with meaning. But that's my zone of comfort. The meaning allows you the comfort because it gives you a predictable way of living that says there must be permanency in your life, a permanent home, permanent job, permanent security. So you're going to look for those people. You're going to be a Democrat and support a social system that gives you social uh, in uh, social support. So whatever happens, you're taken care of. Now, freedom will not be important to you. You will live through other people's freedom. You'll watch television and you'll watch, you read magazines and you read about other people who become free. You'll live a fantasy existence and project through them. And all the time your life is a fantasy, but it's never actualized. Because security is most important. You'll not challenge security. You won't get out of line and only unless it's socially acceptable within that. The suburban and the rural, the meaning of a rural existence is completely different than the suburban existence, different than an inner city existence. And all these create different meanings for life. And that's what frequently limits people. Now, if you're focused upon the mental, physical, and spiritual self, then ask, how does a meaning affect you that allows you to break through old barriers to create new realities. Excuse me, could you repeat that, sir? Yeah. What I'm saying is you know what you are right now. You know everything about yourself. There's not a single corpuscle of being that you're not familiar with in your body, in your mind, in your beliefs. Because you've been living the same life ad nauseum every day of your life, right? Now you want, am I wrong? All right? All right? Now you want something different. Because very probably you're figuring that there's a real you in there that hasn't had a chance to come out yet. And the real you can't come out as long as you're honoring the old meaning. You can't have a new self and an old meaning. Then it's still the old self. That's why you got the old self. That's why your life is so boring and so predictable, because there's nothing new. And every time you want something new and you look for something new, then the fears start coming up, and then the excuses to honor the fears, and then the uncertainties that are bounded. So you want to go transcend the fears and transcend the boundaries and transcend the old self and break open to whoever you are. But you may not know who you are. You may not even recognize who you are. You may be so radically different when you finally come out that no one's going to be able to accept you. And that's why you have to start by accepting that whatever you become, that's who you are. And now you've got to give some meaning. What do you want to have in your life? What do you want to have meaning for? What meaning do you want? What do you want to mean? You've got to create it or it's not going to exist. 
You can't go by the old. You've got to create it new. You've got to sit down and write out what you want to have as meaningful in your life. You do know. You know you fantasized a thousand times about things that you wanted, desired, and didn't have the courage to do anything about. There's no secrets in your life. All right, none. Never use the excuse you don't know what you want. You know exactly what you want. You've wanted it 10 billion times. You've thought about it nonstop. You just haven't had the courage to do it. This whole thing is about the courage to do it. And you start by writing it out and looking at it. And each day getting up and say, all right, today I'm going to take a step towards this. I'm going to create meaning through this that I want to be. And that's why I say projection. Start to picture where you want to be and who you want to be and what you want to look like, what your body wants to look like, how you want to feel, who you want around you. Because if you don't do that, it's never going to happen. It'll stay up here as an intellectual exercise. You've got to make it happen. It can't be intellectual. It's got to be visceral. It's got to be physical. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Yes? The way you were talking, you were saying things that made it sound like a lot of people live through other people. They do. People do live through other people. Okay, Constantly. The other thing I was thinking of... Watch what happens when Madonna gets a new haircut. <laughs> oh. Okay. Right. The other thing I was thinking immediately of was Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis. Yes. Play, where the person wakes up... Um, wasn't a human being anymore. He was an insect. And uh, wasn't it Kafka? Yeah. 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 And uh, that's a total change. And the person had to deal with that total change. Well, that's an insect. But how many times? But, okay. So let's say that, that it's not an insect. Let's say that you wake up yourself again, but you have to deal with yourself again. No, you don't. That's the whole idea. You keep thinking you have to go back and caretake for this old wounded self. You don't, because if you do, then every guilt you've ever had is going to still be there. You're going to have to get everyone else's permission to make the changes. You're going to have to get your children and your sons and permission. You're going to say, look, your mother wants to change. You know, well, why do you want to change, Mom? Well, because I have my own real, you know, well, don't go changing. You're on my... No, you don't have to honor that old self. You keep thinking you have to honor the old self. You don't. The moment you put attention on the old self, there's no attention for the new self. It's like the person who keeps reading again about the book that they've known backwards and forwards. It stops them from reading about a book they've never read on a topic that they've never had interest in. The comprehensivist mind opens itself up and has a flexibility and fluidity that can be anything, anywhere, at any time it wants to be. It is our original meaning that we become a lawyer, a doctor, we become rich or poor, we stay in the ghetto, we get out of the ghetto, we stay in the suburbs, we get out of the suburbs, we stay in the country, we don't. All those are someone else's ideas for us. As long as you continue to honor that, then you stay there. Vicarious. Yes, it, it's more than vicarious. Now, how predictable are you? Because the predictability of your life and your actions will determine whether or not you're actually going to change because if you decide you no longer want to be predictable, then you've got to break the habits, all your habits. You've got to become different. And in the process of becoming different, you're allowing yourself to be who you really are. Yes? <laughs> Haven't you been hearing what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, why do you care what other people think? No, if you do care, then you're no longer going to be different. You're going to still think about what other people think. No, well, I don't have time for that. Then why bring the issue up? Because they really, they get on your nerves. No, 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 now you're giving them power. They get on your nerves. No one gets on my nerves. They can't. I don't allow them. You have to allow it. No, you're allowing that someone else is going to get on your nerves if you're too different. So therefore, why should you be so different? Because you don't want the hassle of the nerves. You see, you're still giving power well, to other I'm people. Well, you obviously let it bother you. You wouldn't have brought it up. You wanted some reaffirmation. Now, if we stop being predictable, if we open ourselves up to the other self, what is your other self? It's the other self that's going to be the real self in this new life. And the other self must be vulnerable 
if you become the old self, you're harder, unyielding. Hardness and unyielding does not allow growth. Think how many people pride themselves in being so orthodox, so ramrod rigid, so self-righteous that nothing changes. Fine, then go away from them. Let them be that. There are enough people in the world who are yielding, open, and vulnerable, who are manifesting the best of all natures. You don't need to be around these people anymore. There's no scarcity. If we face challenge through distraction, then we're not going to be changing. If we face the challenge honestly and openly and look at solutions, then we will transform ourselves. You've got to develop a new attitude, a new focus. Don't become defensive. Don't become hypercritical. Instead of paying attention to what doesn't work, start looking at what does. There are things that you know will work. You've all experimented a little bit. In your experimentation, you have felt things that gave you pleasure. You have done things that gave you peace of mind. Now what you have to do is have the confidence to recreate those every day. So there is pleasure, there is growth, there is challenge, there is process every day. We do it as a peekaboo thing. We go out, we do something that no one knows about, even something as simple as eating some vegetarian food. We like it, we come back, but then it's hidden. We become this kind of quiet person. Well. What if you decided that you want to give yourself pleasure and the healing and healthy self is finding pleasure in life? Not suffering, pleasure. Pleasure is a natural response to being open. See, when you're vulnerable, you're not going to be knocked over so easy. People can't hurt you because you're not taking things personally because you know who you are. You're not going to become defensive. You're not going to have a chip on your shoulder. You're not going to be belligerent. You're not going to be critical of everything. You're not going to be negative. You're not going to gossip and whine and moan and complain. There's no room for that. That's the old self. That's the old self with no meaning. There's a new meaning, and the new purpose of that meaning is to honor life. To honor the new life, you have to honor the essences of life. The essence is creation. You're showing that you are honoring the creation of your own life by being creative. You're doing things you never thought you could do, and you're taking risks. You don't care if you don't do them right, so what? It's a growth process. Whatever allows you to proceed is positive. Look at trees. No true trees are ever the same. There are multiple imperfections, but they're still a part of the perfection of life. Don't criticize yourself. Don't beat up on yourself for your process of growth. You're the only one who has a right to judge yourself. And when you take that issue, then it gives you new meaning. Then you start to grow in all ways. You have interests you never had. The construction worker that suddenly finds a ballet of interest. The ballet enthusiast that suddenly finds um, you know, kite flying of interest. And suddenly you start looking at everything in life. You start breaking old habits. And when you wake up each morning and recreate your life, you'll put things in it that didn't exist before. And that is the excitement of being up on a roller coaster for the first time. You don't know what's going to come from it, but you're not afraid of it. Fear no longer dictates what you will or will not do. You see, I said this last time, let me reaffirm it. Tomorrow, I'm going to be interviewed by a network show. I don't know whether it be positive or negative, but let's say it's negative. Let's say it's a setup. Which it could be. You'll see it when it comes out. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst? No, they, I mean if they air it, right? What's the worst that could happen if they... So they try to make it look like I'm a shyster or a con artist or uh, whatever they want to make me look like, right? That doesn't affect me at all because I know who I am. I'm the one who knows where my heart and soul is. I'm the one who knows what my body and mind are capable of doing. I'm the one who has to nurture that each day, not them, not anyone else. The people who have shared unconditionally with me will continue to share unconditionally with me. And the rest I could care less about. 
Remember, I never care about what doesn't work. I only care what does. My meaning is taken from that which honors life. My meaning is never taken from that which dishonors it. Therefore, I don't get depressed ever. Depression and boredom don't exist in my life because every moment has meaning. The child comes out and plays. Always. So how are you going to hurt that? You might beat up on the image, but so what? So what? Who in this world has the right to criticize anyone else? Who is so perfect? No one. So we just take all this so we become hypersensitive, and we shouldn't be. If someone hadn't seen you in five years, would they be surprised by you today? If they're not, then you're not doing something right. You should be able to surprise people every year. <laughs> it should be a good surprise. It should be an exciting surprise. Usually they like, you know, people, uh, if you change, they don't like It's you. not important to find people who will like you. What it is. Usually they like people who haven't said, oh, this thing. But we don't care about what's usual, right? Let me ask you something. Walt Whitman was criticized in his day. Who? Walt Whitman, a great American uh, writer. He wrote Leaves of Grass and John Everell Down. They were so in contempt of him they'd actually spit at him. Today, of the millions of people who didn't like him, how many of those do we remember? None. Zero. But we remember Walt Whitman. We only take positive messages from the hero, the higher ideal that creates a meaning that honors life, that transcends time and all other realities. That is the person that is not stopped by tradition or common value. And when you put yourself in a position to have ideals that allow you to excel, it brings everything up. Money's not a part of it. Walt Whitman was penniless. We remember Gandhi. We don't remember his critics. He lives on. His ideal, his meaning, has inspired many people to have greater meaning. Martin Luther King. We don't remember the people in the FBI that wanted him to commit suicide, but we remember him. Now think of what you could do to be who you really are and give new meaning to your life and excel. Don't ever be afraid to excel. Now, excel does not mean compulsive. It does not mean dominance. And it does not mean a need to win. It means excel in self. Bring yourself up to your highest ideal and maintain it daily. And you know, you become energized by it. You just keep getting more and more energy because you start seeing that every time you open up your eyes, something new is there, something new appears. Because you're willing to see things you weren't willing to see. You're willing to feel things you weren't willing to feel. You're willing to breathe in new energies you weren't before. You're willing to accept people in ways that you wouldn't have accepted them. Cultures and religions and, and races and, and sexual things. You're willing to be more absorbing and trusting in the vulnerability of your new meaning and new self. That raises excellence. Who is the wiser person? The person that stays with their dogmas and rituals and security that is insecure in the valley or the person that's freed themselves to go to the top and now has the vistas of everything in life? Every moment you free yourself, you give yourself another potential. There is no potential with predictable patterns. Break the pattern and you create a potential. I don't care if someone doesn't finish the marathon, I want to see them start it. The courage to start means they have the potential to finish it. If they lack the courage to start, they'll never finish it. It'll be a dream, a fantasy. Failure doesn't exist when you are trying to be yourself. Experience 
is not failure. Someone else's projection is it's failure. Yours, it's experience. So yours becomes a life filled with experiences, all of which you grow through. Theirs become one a failure. They're afraid to try because they're afraid to fail. They're afraid of what people will think. They're afraid of what they'll lose. They're afraid of the image that will change. They're afraid of having a meaning that is not honoring other people's meaning. We are terrified of the autonomous person in our society. And yet, the paradox is we look up to these images of people who have been uh, the heroes, the warriors, but we just don't think we can emulate them. That is not true. You can be all the above. You can be a healer, a warrior, a sage. You can be a prophet. You can be everything. It's only when people say, well, you're not qualified in that area. What are you talking about that for? Hmm? You're a chiropractor. What are you talking about energies for? You're, you see, we like to keep you limited. We like to control the meaning of your life by the rewards of keeping within the meaning. Create your own meaning. You create the rewards big difference in how you feel. That's it for tonight.